All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Everybody have a good evening. So today's we're, we're going to be no more sticky notes, no more posters. We're going to now take and learn about what do we do with these problem statements? Like how do we form teams at our local organizations? How do we leverage all of the resources that are in this like DOD, like innovation ecosystem that are already funded and like sitting waiting for you to, uh, to, to leverage that. So, I mean, you know, we have Luke, guys at Luke, you guys have a spark cell. Little Rock, you guys are like uh, proto spark cell, like in progress. I don't have any other spark cell, official spark cells in here. So you guys, give me a definition of a spark cell in your own words. Intentional innovation hub. Intentional innovation hub. What else? Helping airmen on the cutting edge. Helping airmen. Yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes kill all like a, a think tank for like the wing commander, or like a problem solving body that helps the wing as an organization solve its own problems. So there's an airman focus like customer base. There's also leadership that has problems that need to be solved. But regardless, there are, you know, getting a spark cell stood up helps build a team that can solve problems. We talked about the lone innovator. I mean, imagine trying to do what you did yesterday by yourself for like every problem you encountered. How successful do you think you would be? Right, <laughs> you don't. You have your perspective. We talked about the different lenses. We talked about the different like worldviews. If you if you're trying to do this on your own, you're only going to see what you bring to the table, and then you're you're only going to be limited to the amount of creativity that you have in your own body. So having a team like these fine lieutenants at NJEP sitting around, probably playing like beer pong and VR. Um, and they actually have a team to solve problems. So, like, this, you know, this was just an interesting picture. I always like to make fun of the lieutenants at Edge Up because I always had fun with them at Shepard, uh, the maintenance officers versus the Edge Up students. Uh, but, you know, they're doing some really cool stuff. They're doing this pilot training with these light, lightweight uh, headsets, and there's a, people that are solving lots of problems like across the base. It doesn't have to be a technical solution. We've got like uh, Klamath is doing a really interesting uh, like resiliency team to help, you know, stitch together like all of the organizations like the chaplain and uh, family support office and like really doing some interesting things with fitness program. Whatever problem you have at your base, Sparkzell is where people bring the problems and it help try to solve those problems. Just like we talked about with all of the team like formation, important pieces of this is having also not just different perspectives and different colors and people who are, you know, athletes and creatives, but also having the people from the different like functional areas. If you remember back to like the first video on day one, we talked about you have people from marketing and you have people from operations and logistics and legal, and they form these teams to like create things. We have our own little tribes too, right? And everybody has a function and a reason to exist. So if you're, you know, a maintenance person, you you might, you know, have a problem that, you know, you're going to have to work with ops on, or maybe they're going to have a different perspective on it because they probably have a lot of these people, they probably have a lot of these people, and they definitely have a lot of those people, just like everybody else, but they bring their own like perspective from their experiences. So you get the operational backgrounds on how people solve problems. But then you also have some people have some very important roles to play, um, like legal, comm flight, you know, your force support folks, contracting. So like making these people a part of the team, so they have a representative on the team. So when you start solving problems, you're bringing them into the mix. You want to, you don't want the FM people to be the last people you talk to when you need a dollar to to go out and solve a problem. Do you want to start talking to them early about how does this fit into our budget, into our plan? What can we expect? The same thing with contracting. What are my avenues? If I have this problem and I'm trying to solve it, what's the best way for me to do it? Not go to them and say, we found this thing and we need to buy it. Now you need to do it. 
Like <laughs> that, that usually doesn't work well. Same comp flight. Comp flight is the no people, right? But if you go to them ahead of time and say, hey, here's something we'd like to do, they may say, hey, we can't do it that way, but maybe there's another way we can work together on it. It's all about building a team that can help you get to yes. Okay. The you know, spark cell charter, there's a lot of this debate and discussion about this. Some, some spark cells have a formal charter. Do you guys have a formal charter? Um, hey, Luke, signed. not signed, but an unsigned charter. It's close enough. We know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've heard that too. So, like, you can get started and just start doing things, and like, you can build that like credibility and legitimacy. And if people are, are chipping in, that's great. One of the things that we like to talk about when we talk about drafting this charter is like formalizing the organization. So, we have all of these formal organizations on the base. You have like your top three. Your, junior enlisted council and this and that. And those things exist and throughout leadership changes and turnover. And by formalizing this activity, getting the buy-in of leadership and who's on the team, what are they going to do? What's the battle rhythm? How often are we going to meet? What are we, what is our focus? Like, like those are the kind of things that help take this or, an organization and make it outlast the two-year cycle of every wing commander and the three-year cycle when people come in. Go ahead. You said there's like debate on this, is there like pushback? Well, there's debate on whether charters are necessary. Some of those spark cells have, have self like organized and have like, you know, verbal backing. It's kind of like a voco, like just go do it. It's just, which we all know is great until somebody changes their mind and says, I never said that, or uh, you guys are, are going too fast or doing something. So just this gets everybody's comfort level up to say, we know that this is going on. This is sanctioned. This isn't the Wild West. This isn't people doing whatever they want and being, you know, running with scissors or all the other silly words that we hear all the time. Like, this is a formal activity that the wing does to improve the organization. There's like a, there's a kind of a tension between the idea that we have that we're looking for self authorizing behavior and then we're going to get an official document that authorizes all of our behavior. So we haven't signed ours yet because we want that flexibility. So it's constantly changing. So every week, every month, we get in there and we update it. Um, like we just got Zach in from the MSG. So we now brew the MSG inside the charter. So like I said, it's always evolving. That's why we haven't signed it yet. So you can do, you can have one that's a little bit more spelled out, but you could also just have a really rough outline one page which just says like, this is the activity. And from time to time, the membership will change. And then you can document like membership on like a different like document, like bylaws or some kind of org chart. So like inherent, you know, flexibility in these kind of documents, because we do know that like people are going to come and go and the makeup's going to change and focus is going to change, but you can have it reviewed like quarterly, annually, whatever you want to do. We have templates for this. We also have a worksheet that kind of goes along with this briefing. That we're going to send you guys a, a file, a Google Drive folder with all these like uh, presentations and stuff. And, um, and you can go through when you're walk, looking through this briefing and it has a little space on there like, okay, who's my contracting person? Who's my MSG rep? Who's my contracting person? Who's my FMR? And then, you know, you start writing down like these things into the worksheet and then the worksheet helps you fill out the Spark Cell like uh, charter template. And then if you need help, we can help you like review it and then socialize it with like leadership so that you can get like formal buy-in and stand up. So really, I, mean, I need to update this briefly. We're going to cross out ideas and soliciting problems, right? So what did we talk? We talked about problems, right? We started with a problem, and then the problem led to the ideas on how to solve it. It's not, it's not, sometimes ideas are great. We can source an idea, and then we can validate that it is solving the right problem. But the problem comes in is like you walk around your base. You start asking people. Hey, do you have any new ideas? Do you have any new ideas? What do you think I'm gonna say? No, I'm not an idea person. I just work here, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, go out to the smoke pit, go to like the chow line, like, hey, what's, what's really not working right now? What sucks in your job? Like, what do you wish we could fix? They will talk your ear off about problems. Some of them are just complaints. 
I mean, we used to always say, like, you know, if Joe's not complaining, Joe's not happy, you know, kind of thing. But to a point, there are real concerns at work areas that people find. They're like, this is just silly. Why do we do this? So starting with problems, you can get a lot more of those from your people. And we've had people doing this in, like, all different sorts of fashions. we got, like, you can walk around the base and just talk to different, like, work areas as, like, your spark cell, like, rep and say, hey, what, what do you guys want us to like look at? What do you need help with? We even have people do like old school, like, like, you know, card on a bulletin board, drop it in a box, you know, put your name on it and submit like a problem or an idea that we can help you with. Um, you know, pitch competitions are an interesting way to do things. If you have like a set aside, like pool of money or resources, um, there's just a lot of different ways to do it. Have you guys done anything specific at Luke that you think is uh, helpful? <clears throat> just getting out there. You, yeah, you got to make the effort to get into every section, every shop, every squadron group. You got to get out there and advertise yourself. No one's going to do it for you. <laughs> You're in this position or we're in this position for a reason. Our job is to market. Listen there and get the ideas out there and have them grow. So having everyone on base know who you are helps a lot. Zach, he, he's vice president of our five six council. He sees every single NCO on the base. So you know it, that's marketing right there. So he's in, he oversees every single one of these individuals. He'll slip in, hey, spark cell, come up. We'll help you with the that helps me um, before I moved in this position. I did the same thing. I was president of uh, top three. Everyone knows who I am on this. So yeah. just get out there. The other thing is like, so some of the cigar bases, like it's hard to get space allocations because like it's very controlled. Like you have this many people, you're allocated this many like square feet, but there's, there's probably like an unused room somewhere on the base. So, the gym. Yeah, pretty much. The gym. Uh, some bases have like a little sweat closet that they call a gym. There's always a couple of people there in there every day. But uh, like the 129th up in uh, Mountain View, the C-130, uh, I think when they went from, I'm not a C-130 person, but they basically, they used to have a battery shop when they were like H models and now they don't have batteries anymore or something. So they have this like room it's probably about the size of that office in a block building. And they put a couple of computers around the room and like uh, some things that people can play with and whiteboards. And you could hold like, to say, hey, we're gonna be in this room on drill weekends for two hours. If you've got a problem, come and see us. I mean, you think about like a Sunday after drill, like the afternoon, people have come in and dealt with something they didn't want that doesn't work and they're frustrated. You wanna catch them while it's fresh. And like you can even do this in like a conference room until you like eventually get your own space. The other interesting thing we've seen is that because you can't get real property, you can sometimes set up these prefab buildings inside of a building. Like they have one at Luke, we did one at Memphis, and now it's considered equipment. And the only thing you have to get CE to do is run power to them. And they're not that expensive. So if you have like an atrium and an hangar or you have a you know, a, a, an unused corner of a warehouse, it, it, you know, isn't really hospitable, like for human like life, you can put a building in a building and the government does not consider that real property. It becomes equipment on an equipment account. So that's a kind of a cheat code way to build like an innovation lab at a guard base without having to go to A4 and ask for like space allocation. So. <laughs> What was that? What's that TLF? That one? No, it's like a like those little prefabs. You find it back in like double weapon. Yeah, so it's like double weapon trailer. You set it down on their silly, and it and from a force perspective, it's a piece of equipment. There's just like prefab panels that get a cell. Ours is a dock box inside a hangar. So ours is uh so we have a 1,000 square foot idea space which is over in community commons. So that's where FTAC is, FSS, all that. And then we have our makerspace, which is 2,000 square foot, and it's a dock box. All concept, kind of like this, um, even with the holes. Uh, 
um, but it's a temporary building. Yeah, you'll see there's like a bunch of varieties. These basically prefab panels that like assemble like a giant Ikea set and you like literally just bolt the building together and like they even have air conditioning units and stuff. So like if it's in a hangar or a heater in New York or some of the other places, okay. don't really. If you're interested in something like that, you can talk to me after. I have secrets of contact that they have access to something we can Space is really difficult and guard bases are so wildly different from like place to place that like it's really hard to like give people like go do this because like, I mean, the 162nd is a collection of huts. Like it's like the most random like building like layout I've ever seen on like a guard base. It's like, like thousands of little buildings within like 10 feet of each other. And some base have these massive brand new like hangers and some people are on active duty bases. Like it's just you got to figure out what works for your people, but be creative. Again, don't let people tell you no without giving you an alternative way to get yes. So, so some of the stuff we did yesterday is this kind of thing you're going to do when you get your team assembled. So you're like, you think about your team and getting the right people with the right like points of view, the right backgrounds. Now you've got problems coming in. Now you can form teams around these problems and you can start doing these things like looking into the problems, doing, you could do these drills. You can learn how to do these on your own. We will help you get started. We can get you access to like materials, Daniel's going to talk about how they help with CyberWorks and Agitere and like uh, the community practice that they have. I probably butchered the pronunciation of that, but it's. Um, yeah, I really did. Most people. Most people. I like it. Um, but, you know, the, the thing you have is like, it's not just about like the right like worldview. Make sure you, 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 you need somebody that like knows about the problem. So everybody, every problem team yesterday had a SME. Everybody had a, somebody who understood the real technical pieces of it, but you saw the value of bringing in those other people that were just helping solve the problem. Because some, if, you have, if everybody is so close to the problem and they can't see the forest through the trees, then like you're just gonna come up with the same type of solutions. That's why we include, like we do this here. So you can see that like, I had no idea about anything about how FM does budgeting and GPCs, but I was legitimately helping solve this problem and like bringing my perspective to it or the same thing like EOD, like, you know, so like in the same thing with the, uh, the mission control thing, like those are very domain specific problems, but you having these buried people on a team helps get you to the right place. You know, then uh, a lot of these problems, somebody may already have been started on solving. So we're in, we'll talk a little bit about uh, vision and platform because we, um, are about to try to like push all the guard ideas in here. There's already like a thousand Air Force projects in this like new platform that's online. Uh, but if you just, you know, want to run something by us, give us a call, Dana, or Steve, who's not here, you'll get to meet next time or myself or Jonesy or Kim, we can look through and say, hey, we know that somebody else is working on this. Maybe it's an active duty unit, a reserve unit, a guard unit. Let us get you in touch with them so that you're not like starting from scratch. Maybe your problem is similar enough so that you can team up, you know? And then we talked a lot of yes, um, day one about MVPs and about, and then yesterday afternoon about starting small and like doing hypothesis, like experiments. If you come and ask us for a hundred grand to test something, we're probably gonna tell you no. Like it's very rare that you, have not, you can't figure out a way to test something at a smaller level. Some things you have to buy equipment to like actually test it, but there needs to be a lot of work ahead of that to understand like the underlying problem is going to be solved by whatever piece of equipment or software that you need to purchase before we get ourselves into some kind of like contractual obligation and spend money that we can't get back. So starting small is, you know, the name of the game. Yesterday or uh, Monday, I got an email from uh, the 115th in Madison. And we're going to find out more about it, but exactly like they said, hey, we just started a spark cell in conjunction with the University of Wisconsin. Like that is amazing. That's exactly the kind of thing that the guard and reserve units that, you know, have, and that duty does too, but we have deep ties to our communities and we're in locations that they're not. There's no more Griffiths Air Force Base. It's just Rome and a couple people, right? 
there's like, there's, you know, there's definitely not any, any other military units in Portland, Oregon. You know, there's like, you know, there's, you know, we have these locations all over the country and we have people that are deeply embedded in their community. I mean, if you walk around a flight line and you're a maintenance guy or you're walking around in a warehouse, you'll see the people, you ask them what they do on their day job and you'll be blown away. I used to have like enlisted maintainers that like multiple electrical engineering degrees, and PhDs and worked at like Sikorsky or Raytheon or had their own businesses. And, you know, they did like, you know, and then all the college students, like we discount like all the kids going to college, but they are living in like an ecosystem and have access to those professors and they know about the labs that they're using and like things that might be helpful to like solve those problems. So like making sure that we bring those people into the smart cells, the DSGs. How many of you guys have GSUs, like geographically separated units? Is there a GSU for EADS? Two. Space people? No, they're both down in DC. So JDAC oh. and uh, so they're, they're part, but they're now part of like BCC Spark, right? Kind of. They should be. It's kind of hard because those are like missions that you can't really don't have a lot of spare time, like you know the people to rotate in and things like that. Yeah, what our so the army folks rotate, but we have permanent uh, party, 40, 40 Air Force, New York National Guard members at the JDOC. That so yeah, so if they're not part of the Spark team, then you should probably you know like make sure because they have a different they have a different perspective from being in that environment versus like what you guys do on a day to day basis. And like same thing, my unit has four GSUs and they're just random like cats and dogs: a fighter wing with a red horse, an aerospace and air air operations group, uh, joint command and control like airborne comm guys, and a space launch unit. You, know, you think there, there, there's going to be some totally different ways of solving problems there that we want to tap into. And, you know, so making sure you have all those people because they're going to have these connections. You know, it may be a while, you may not have like ties to it, but we asked uh, Dana, you were going to tell them a story about Klamath and when you went up there to visit them. Yeah, we went in town. So, we got some of the 3D printers. They didn't. There weren't oh, just like three printers. You get them, they're great, so you're here, but you don't know how to use them. I heard you guys talk about that yesterday. Um, anyway, so in, in Klamath Falls, they have Oregon Institute of Technology, which is a really, it's a great school. And they, um, they came together, we brought the maintainers together. The maintainers were like, this is what we're struggling with. This is what we need help with. This is what we have. And OIT said, well, this is where we can help you. And this is where really in turn, you're helping us, our students, our program. And then, so as we just did the introductions, the brief introduction, the conversation, like Steve and I just sat back and the conversation just, you know, developed into um, a relationship now that they are continuously working together. And it's more than, even with that initial meeting started as. Yeah, and I, so as a precursor to that, we had a couple of their folks come down here and do like brainstorm before we did his site visit. I was saying, you know, all right, a lot of the guard bases think they're like, oh, we're totally out here on our own. We're in this little tiny town. There's nothing around us. Klamath Falls is like 60,000 people, like, you know, pretty remote, right, <laughs> for Oregon. And we said, well, you got to have something. And like, what kind of colleges? And they said, yeah, OIT is like down the street. I'm like, what are your connections? Are we have 40 alumni? And I'm like, and like, I bet you have somebody who knows uh, chancellor, dean, a professor or something. <laughs> so they went and started those conversations when they went home. And I said, what else? What, who else in your wing has like a really interesting job outside of the wing? And they're like, well, the vice wing commander is the president of the chamber of commerce. That could be useful, right? Maybe, maybe he's got some businesses. And then, but you know, the problem is we always think of businesses as like we have to hold them at arm's length. These are just people that are going, we're going to sell us stuff. But these people are part of the community, the guards part of the community. So these are people that you could be, they could be mentors, they could be coaches for your spark cell. They have like honorary wing commander programs. Why don't you make them an honorary member of your spark cell? There's literally nothing that says you can't do this kind of stuff. And these people would love to be involved. Like we have a University of Arizona, like Forge program that they just stood up and it's like bringing entrepreneurs and Brett together with the university and we're already doing events with them. 
bringing them over here, meeting their entrepreneurs. They're giving us ideas. We're giving them ideas. It's not a transactional like relationship. It's true like relationship building in the community. The other thing is these people have resources. You would be amazed at how many little startup garage help places are out there. I went to Mansfield, Ohio, another town that's not really big. And in this like, re, like kind of revitalizing rust belt downtown, I was driving through. There's this like little startup like hub called like, you know, Startup Ohio. And like, I'm like, you guys could probably go in there and use their meeting space, pay $200 and get a membership. It might have a 3D printer you can use. Some of my maker spaces right down the road here, there's a maker space on six and warehouses. They got tools, welders, all kinds of stuff. Like if you don't want to go and like burn Air Force metal, you can probably, you know, get some scrap and play around with some stuff. Like there's just tons of resources in the community and we've got to be able to get outside the gate and have real conversations with people and build these relationships because we have an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is we have these little tiny bases that don't have a lot of support. The advantage is we have the community right outside our gate that can provide a lot of the stuff that like Andrews or Luke might have like on base. You guys have any good examples? Everybody found something cool? Oregon, Fort Wayne. You got Fort Wayne's by how close are you guys to Chicago? About two and a half hours. But we're like two and a half hours from Indy. Two and a half hours from Detroit, yeah. But we're we have a ton of kids that work at BAE. Yeah, it's a big industrial. Yeah, thing. we're very big into uh, DOD like projects all over the place. So a lot of manufacturing expertise process. Then, like I would say probably. 30% of the kids that are like DSGs that are going to school, Purdue, IU, Rose Holman, yeah. like all those big top universities, yeah. smart people. Yeah. And, you know, we thought we talked, I know some conversations at like happy hour about like, hey, these guys go to school and like there's really not a lot we can do to keep them. This is one of these things that might keep them, especially somebody's like going to get an engineering degree. They said, you know what, maybe I'll, maybe I'll re up for a year. Maybe I'll do like another hitch because. Now I'm not just like sweeping the floor when I come to drill. We all know that's what a lot happens with our like part-time people. They get frustrated because they don't get to do the job they got hired to do because the mission tempo is too fast or they fall behind on their training or there's just something else going on. So like if you could take these smart people and keep them, maybe we get them working on a couple of projects. Be like, hey, I know you're going to Purdue and you got an electrical engineering degree. We're trying to work on this problem and we need somebody who can help us with circuit card repair or something. They would jump on that, even if they're not an avionics or EIS person. Like, you know, they're, you know, we can use people outside of their AFSCs. I mean, that you can do that with DSGs. You can't do that with a technician, but you can do that with DSGs. Like you can do a lot of things that keep people like involved and it helps with retention, it helps with morale, and it helps the unit accelerate change. Uh, so for us, we have access to like a lot of the tech companies. So Microsoft being one of them. So we have some folks there that we can just like Microsoft and a lot of companies provide free support mm -hmm. to solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll throw actual resources at you. So you can come with like the problems that we did yesterday. Like a lot of these companies will just take it on for you sometimes. Yeah. So, right? so, I mean, you know, we all you do is pick up the phone. Like, we just started calling people. Like, I had a chance meeting with the guy who's like the chief of staff of Pima Community College. It turns out he's like a retired army uh, aviator. And he's like, oh, yeah, we have a cyber training lab and it's like world class. I'm like, I'm like, that's that's really interesting. So, we brought like all our cyber training people out from like a test center and like they're like oh we're building an advanced manufacturing center downtown it's like ten thousand square feet of like innovation hub space and like these things and these people are, are super excited if you call and say hey i'm with guard base x and we're we're we need we're trying to build relationships so that we can help improve the unit and we've got some like technical challenges we might need some help with they will go out of their way to like be, be there but there's like <laughs> I mean, we can, I can spend all day on this slide because I'm super passionate about this. But, you know, even if you go, if you're just looking for like inspiration, you want to learn more about different technology, 
and just want to go listen. Like there's a lot of these little like entrepreneurship startup organizations in every town. There's a group out of Kansas City called the Kaufman Foundation. It's like the large, it's the country's largest entrepreneurship uh, nonprofit. They support like millions of dollars of programming. They do this thing all across the country. They probably are getting started up again now because of COVID called One Million Cups. So they'll be at like all these little like economic development organizations and startup studios. they will be like one day a week and everybody comes in for in the morning, gets a cup of coffee, sits down and listens to somebody pitch a business idea. No money. It's not a competition. They just, they just want feedback. They want feedback on our ideas. You can just go and listen and like, man, I had never thought of that. That could be something we could do, or I could give you some feedback on this. And you're building those relationships and all, all it took you was an hour out of your day. So like you know, time is the hard part, but if you can put the time in, there's a, there's a lot of benefit. All right, so the rest of the day, we're gonna hear from people that are going to be able to tell you about all of these programs that can help us take a problem that we validated and, and tested and build it up and scale it to where it fits for your unit or help us scale it across like the whole Air Force or the whole DOD or the whole National Guard. 